Uh, thank you, Professor Sanjay, and uh, uh, also the moderators and my very good friend, uh, Dr. Sivaram uh, Singh, who is also in the audience as one of the moderators. Uh, thank you for giving me this uh, uh, invitation and to talk about challenges and advances in the management of hydrated disease, uh, commonly known as the echinococcosis. Now, uh, it's an exciting time for this disease. This is one of the neglected diseases defined by the WHO out of the 17 entities and uh, the uh, WHO wants to control this disease by 2050. So, but more than that, there have been many, many major advances in the disease. So what I propose to do the next maybe 35 or 40 minutes is to get you uh, what give an indication of where are the areas of uh, research and advances and uh, expertise in the area of uh, echinococcosis. Our interest uh, at the Sherry Kashmir Institute of Medical Science has been uh, on this disease right from uh, uh, decades. The reason for that is that uh, cystic echinococcosis is highly endemic in Kashmir. And also now lately we're seeing uh, quite a bit of uh, alveolar uh, uh, echinococcosis related to uh, uh, related to echinococcus multilocularis. So we see both of these diseases uh, in uh, Kashmir. Okay. Uh, echinococcus is uh, for people, uh, for uh, clinicians uh, from Western Europe, if they are one, or from US, is to introduce this disease that it is a zoonotic infection caused by the metacystor, that is the larval form of the type form of uh, uh, echinococcus, uh, which is found in the small intestines of all the carnivores. Now, what are the challenges and advances in this disease? The most important advance is that based on genomic and molecular epidemiology of the causative agent, uh, there has been uh, 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 a flurry of uh, classification of this disease and it's no more a uniform disease like we said, hydrated cyst and alveolar hydrated cyst. I'll, I'll uh, get to next few slides on the uh, taxonomic classification of uh, uh, echinococcosis. The second advance, uh, particularly for us, has been for clinicians that we can now stage and also look at the activity of the clinical disease. And this is based on uh, uh, imaging, lots of imaging, ultrasound, CT, MR, and PET scan, and also specialized scan uh, scanning of uh, these uh, methodologies supported by serology, particularly with the new antigens and also with the DNA uh, testing for uh, where we can exactly know which is the uh, species of echinococcus infecting. So for cystic echinococcosis, uh, for a clinician, we must understand apart from complicated disease, if it's uncomplicated, we must understand whether it is biologically active transitional or inactive disease. The treatment would depend upon uh, those three entities. And this can be done easily as I'll show in the next few slides based on imaging and serology. For alveolar echinococcosis, it's important to stage the PNM stage, that's the parasite legion, the neighbor organ and the metastasis. And also based on PET scanning, now, as of today, only on PET scanning, but maybe uh, MR and other uh, modalities may help, but basically on PET scanning on alveolar echinococcosis, whether the disease is biologically active or inactive, and the treatment would depend upon that. And also the follow-up will have once we, uh, these people are on uh, long-term uh, uh, 
uh, uh, medical therapy, whether the disease becomes biologically inactive. Now, what are the inputs on treatment and follow-up algorithms? For cystic echinococcosis, surgery has been uh, uh, the main method of management for decades and uh, centuries. But uh, a new surgical tool, what's called total cystectomy, has been is more and more being introduced. I'll explain that. Drug therapy, Pierre will talk about that, which was uh, Dr. Sanjay was mentioning about that, and a wait and watch policy for inactive disease. For bilirubin hydrotosis, I'll just mention to uh, a few slides on that. The endotherapy has come as a major way of managing this disease for cystic echinococcus when it gets to the bile duct. For alveolar echinococcus, radical surgery is important if it is a resectable disease. Now, half-hearted surgery for inoperable disease has been given up and people and these patients who do not are, are, are not resectable, they're basically amenable to drug therapy, long-term drug therapy. Uh, endotherapy, particularly if you have a, a bile duct involvement, which commonly happens. Patients uh, which have advanced disease may be transplanted, and there are series, many series of liver transplantation, but very disappointing because uh, under immunosuppression, this disease recurs very commonly and also metastasis to other organs. So there's a new way of managing, uh, and there are series from China and also from several other areas, what's called ex vivo liver resection with autotransplantation. And uh, there are some very interesting results on this form of treatment that you take out the liver, uh, put it, um, uh, take out the tumor from that and put it back because you don't need immunosuppression uh, however, you will have an anhepatic stage, which can go for some time, but it's a very interesting form of management of alveolar hydrity. And certainly prevention and control, and not talk about that, but safe animal slaughter and dog uh, dosing, particularly months with presecutor, has been very useful, particularly in uh, New Zealand and uh, some regions of Australia, and also some other regions in Europe where the disease has been controlled. So there is some news about vaccine development against intermediate host, that is particularly the sheep. And now there are now some new data that even definitely host can also have uh, uh, vaccines and uh, they may be effective in them. Now, what about this classification I was mentioning about? Echinococcus uh, has been classified into three main uh, forms. One is the cystic echinococcosis, the alveolar echinococcosis, and neonotropical, also called as polycystic or neotropic, neotropical echinococcosis, which is extremely rare. The cystic echinococcosis is caused by echinococcus granulosus. Now, earlier we would say that it's a one disease, no more. Then extensive genetic diversity of this disease. Now, this is based on mitochondrial DNA sequencing of these two genes. And this has been now put into 10 genotypes, genotype one and genotype, two, genotype 10, which can, as I will show in the next slide, go into five uh, 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 you know, variants. Genotype specificity for intermediate host axis. That means if we have one genotype, uh, the intermediate host will be specific for that genotype. That's important. For a definitive host, there is no genotype specificity. And strains and genotype exist. Uh, differences in uh, uh, biological, uh, biology of the uh, parasite and even uh, the pathology is uh, slightly different. The response to drugs and vaccinations also is different uh, in um, uh, hosts. Now, looking at alveolar echinococcosis, the disease is homogeneous. Well, that was highly uh, diverse. The echino alveolar echinococcus is an homogeneous disease caused by echinococcus multidoclaris. Now, uh, mitochondrial DNA sequencing studies have shown a marked uh, genetic homogeneity of this, uh, this parasite. However, 
if you do microsatellite uh, studies as have been done, you have genetic morph polymorphism and 30, at least 39, I think, uh, strains or genotypes have been identified. Now, they may not be important clinically, but for epidemiologically, they are important to trace the origin of uh, the disease. And there have been several studies where uh, this parasite uh, origin has been uh, traced to another continent, another country, particularly from North America to Europe, and also in some of the countries, uh, Australia, uh, the disease has been traced uh, to some other regions of the world. So that's, it's important for epidemiological uh, purposes. Neotropical echinococcus is caused by echinococcus vogli and echinococcus oligarthra. Now these are very rare, particularly in South America. Analysts of nuclear and mitochondrial markers show that they are genotypically uh, variants. They're nearly same, but there are two variants. So. Now this type of uh, thing also may be important because there's some recently new uh, series, uh, new uh, parasites which have been uh, described. One which where the host, where the definitive host is loin and another while there's a Tibetan fox. Now they have been classified based on these uh, genetic uh, studies. So that's important. That's why these studies also will be important from uh, that point of view. Now, based on all what I said, the cystic echinococcus has been defined to five species with 10 genotypes. The main sensonato, that is the whole group, has gone into senso stricto, that which is uh, genotype one to genotype three, and where sheep, goat, and buffalo are the intermediate hosts. And equinus is the horse one. There's no human infections known with this uh, genotype. And uh, odd lepi is one where cattle, which is at least in Kashmir, this is the genotype we have, genotype five, where we get human infections. And there's a very broad uh, 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 species Canadis densis, where there are four or five uh, uh, genotypes, where camel pig and uh, cervids uh, or uh, the intermediate host. And the loin genotype, which has been recently described, doesn't have any uh, human uh, infections. Now, the two forms of alveolar echinococcus, one is the multilocularis, which is the most important, and the one Tibetan uh, doesn't cause any human infections. And neotropical basically is the rare disease, which is mostly reported in South America in some of the regions of South America. So that is uh, the distribution of uh, uh, two forms of echinococcus. Echinococcus granulosus is a cosmopolitan disease. And the incidence in the regions varies from one to 200 per 100,000. So in some of the regions, it's highly endemic, even up to the level that we'll have 200 cases per 100,000. At least in Kashmir, I think we have about 60 cases per 100,000. It's highly endemic in Kashmir. However, as the disease generally is benign, the death rates for 10 to 15 years are a bit low, between 2 to 4%, particularly when you have a biliary rupture or you have a compression on a vital organ or you have a rupture and anaphylaxis. So those are the cause of deaths. Or when you have the, uh, the, inf uh, the cyst gets infected, otherwise the deaths are low. However, in echinococcus multilocris, it is restricted to North American regions and particularly in uh, central uh, uh, North uh, US, uh, Canada and Alaska, you would have definitely cases of that. But how the incidence doesn't go very high, it could be up to one or 1.5%. However, wherever the disease occurs, the death rate over 10 years, if untreated, goes as has 90% because of invasive nature of the disease. We'll talk about that. Now, uh, for people who have not seen echinococcosis, uh, particularly uh, some of the uh, who may not have 
uh, being used to this disease. I just put this basic slide that uh, in the definitive host, we have the adult tapeworm, which is about two to 11 millimeters in size. And it has a scolex, it has a head, which is called scolex. Then it has three proglottids, which is the immature, the mature, and the gravid. The gravid uh, segment is what contains the eggs. And once these eggs are uh, laid, they have an oncosphere, a highly uh, active uh, a larvae in that. It goes into the environment and is taken by the intermediate host. And uh, in the intermediate host, as I'll show in the next few slides, it causes a metacystode. Uh, the metacystode of granulosis in the left side on the three slides has a laminated membrane, a germinal layer, and a brood capsule, which have the scolices. While in alveolar hydrated, which is uh, the one which is uh, somewhere here in this, uh, this uh, picture, you have an extraordinary um, fibrosis and the scolices are just trapped up this uh, fibrous tissue. And this fibrotic disease is extraordinary invasive locally and also causes distant metastasis. So there's a distinct difference between the two uh, diseases. So the life cycle is based on predator prey association. That's important. So the definitive host is mostly uh, the canines and the, the prey of that usually is the uh, intermediate host and then it goes back. So that's how it, uh, that's how it uh, happens. But uh, I just wanted to make one point in this, that the protoscolices, which are uh, in the hydrated, they will go and form an adult worm in the uh, definitive host. But in the intermediate host, they can go into the daughter cysts and grow. So a very important biological uh, feature of this disease that the protoscolices in the intermediate host can go into the daughter cyst, while in the definitive host, they will go into the adult worm. And that's how it looks. On the left side, we have the granulosis, and on the right side, multilocularis. The humans get are incidental hosts. And although there are some uh, data from Africa that humans may be actual hosts, particularly in echinococcus granulosis. And some of the uh, species, the equinus and the uh, loin and uh, uh, the Tibetan species do not cause any human infections. Now let's go on to the cystic echinococcus. That is the hydrated cyst, what we call. We are just scanning electron uh, mic micrograph, which uh, actually from my lab uh, of uh, the worm, that is the uh, scolex, and this is one segment of the worm, and the scolex hooklets are uh, seen uh, beautifully, and this is the transection of the worm, which is taken by electron, which is taken by scanning a microscope. But the disease in the humans is a cystic disease, which can occur in the liver, the lung, and any other organ, but mostly in the liver, can go in the lung and also in many other organs. And this is with uh, laminated membrane with germinal layer and these brood capsules. And that is the uh, uh, that is the how the laminated membrane looks on histology. And you have the brood capsules on the right lower corner, which have the uh, the protoscolices with invaginated uh, uh, structures in them. And that those are the ones when they go into the definitive host, they'll go to the scolex and form the worm. Now, what is the manifestation of cystic echinococcus shortly? Uh, the organs involved as in the uh, lower corner I've shown is 70% is liver, however, 20% would be lung. And other organs can involve five to 10%. And you can see uh, on the right upper uh, is a splenic uh, hydrated, which is calcified. And in the lower one, we have a hydrated 
in the brain. So any other organ can get involved, but commonest is liver and lung. And it basically presents as incidental mass lesion on a routine uh, imaging. However, it grows around one centimeter per year. And if it can go to a large extent and cause pressure on the vital organs, then you get uh, symptomatic disease, particularly uh, it can um, pressure on the bile ducts, portal veins, or in, even the bronchi. Infections occur in about 10%, but the commonest manifestation in liver they cause is a biliary uh, rupture. And there are several forms of it. You have an ocular rupture, but you can even have a frank rupture uh, uh, because of uh, cystic uh, echinococcosis. And this is a classical uh, patient who has a, a cystic disease with ruptured membranes on ultrasound. The ultrasound takes, it has gone already into the bile duct. You can see the bile duct is full of membranes on the ultrasound. And the ERCP in the lower two pictures has shown these laminated membranes which we have taken out. And the right lower corner is the uh, the, uh, the brood capsules, which we have taken out at the uh, duodenoscopy. So uh, this disease is amenable to ERCP. Uh, uh, and we can clear the cyst as well as the bile duct very effectively at uh, endotherapy. So that was one thing about cyst biliary communication. Now, how do we classify if we have a uh, hydrated cyst, that is, an, uh, uh, if it is two forms, one is if it is uh, uncomplicated or complicated. Complicated, as I showed you lower down, can be fistula, exopatic growth, perforation, peritoneal seedling, and hematogenous suppression. Leaving that, the commonest, we see hydrated cysts uh, in the liver as uh, uncomplicated. So how do we look at that? And one of the major problems for the clinicians, particularly who have not seen hydrated, and how really do you uh, classify this disease? So I'll just put you the type of the cyst. If the cyst on ultrasound and also on imaging like CT or MRI is simple, undifferentiated cyst, and you don't see the wall of the cyst. Now, this could be hydrated, or it could be a simple uh, cyst of any other nature in the liver. It will depend upon serology. If serology is positive, and particularly with the ability would be known only uh, based on uh, if you do a cyst puncture and know whether it's viable or not. But more important is we see unilocular cysts in the liver, which have uh, uh, a double wall, either an ultrasound and MRI is slightly better to pick that double wall. And you can have snowflake effect of the hydrated sand inside. Now this usually is a hydrated disease. And if the serology is positive, the disease is active. Uh, Multi-septated cysts, you can have fifth septa or you can have honeycomb. This is the other manifestation. And usually the serology is positive and also the disease is active. However, you can have cysts with daughter cysts in the matrix because over a period of time, the cyst is full of matrix and you can have daughter cysts in that. And usually, usually, even if the serology is positive in these patients, the disease has been defined as trend, transitional. It may not be necessarily active. A heterogeneous cyst and a calcified cyst with negative serology is inactive. And the last part is when the cyst is with a ruptured membranes, uh, usually with positive serology is also transitional. Now the management by this uh, group from WHO and lots of other things have been defined how to manage each and every uh, type of hydrated in a unilocular hydrated. If it is less than five centimeters, then 
albendazole is therapy is really curative, but if it is more than five centimeters, maybe at any size, and if it is at excess, if it is at uh, some place, I'll discuss that later, probably peer technique would be useful. Multiceptated cysts, if there are few, then you can use yet a peer technique. And uh, however, uh, if it is a honeycombic, then it's very difficult to treat it by a peer technique, usually would need surgery. Uh, so this is just a, a classification of how, if a clinician looks at a, a cyst in the liver, how do you classify it and how do you manage it based on this classification? This is what uh, I showed on these six ultrasounds, how these cysts look like. One is, uh, this is the classification by the WHO, uh, that you have a unilocular cyst, multivesicular cyst, that is second. Third is the cyst with ruptured membranes. Here there's a matrix with the uh, uh, cyst disease. Uh, this is heterogeneous mass, and this is a calcified mass. And based on these, you can really, uh, a clinician, even if he has not seen many, uh, he can make up his mind of how to manage uh, these patients, as I showed you in the earlier slide. Now, what are the treatment options for cystic echinococcosis? Surgery has been the gold standard. Treatment for management of uncomplicated as well as complicated high dated in the past. However, there's one surgery which has been introduced off late, which is closed total cystectomy or hepatectomy. Now, this is a very interesting surgery because you don't need to open the cyst. And if you don't open the cyst, this is non-open cyst technique. And some of the Chinese have done uh, brilliant studies on that, that if you, and some of the surgeons even in India also are doing it, that if you don't open the cyst and take it and block, then you will have no spillage and you will have no recurrences. Otherwise, if you open the cyst and use scolicidal agents, there's issue of uh, spillage and recurrence. But in this type of surgery, you may not get it. And however, the disease has to be at a place which is not near to vessels or to bile ducts so that uh, you can take it and block, or you can even do a hepatectomy. Other than that, if the disease is inactive biologically, we wait and watch and uh, do assessment every year to see whether there's an activity of the disease. The drug treatment has been disappointing. Um, there's hardly Earlier, mebendazole was the drug of choice, but because of poor absorption, now albendazole is the drug of choice. I do use some patients who are difficult in, in I add up prosecutorial, although the data on that uh, are there, but not very strong. And if it's a biologically active cyst, uncomplicated, less than five centimeters, probably albendazole therapy is, uh, uh, very good. However, it has its own problems. It causes leukopenia, it causes hepatotoxicity, and it is also teratogenic. So, and sometimes in long-term treatment, we may have to uh, uh, give, uh, use uh, drug uh, uh, levels also to see for long-term albendazole therapy, particularly in uh, alveolar uh, hydratosis. Now, percutaneous drainage plus albendazole is in biologically active cysts, which are more than five centimeters. I'll give you where we have gone on percutaneous drainage and talk about what is the group of uh, patients who are good for uh, PI technique. There is a modified catheter technique, which we are using when there are multiple uh, uh, sub, multi vesicular septi. However, if it's a honeycombing, I usually do not use uh, peer technique. I send up a surgery, endotherapy for biliary uh, communication. And uh, uh, I talked about the surgery, which has become good in a group of patients. So we've been involved uh, since uh, long on uh, describing this percutaneous drainage and hepatic hydrotosis, what the Europeans called as the peer technique. Uh, we broke this age old dogma that you cannot puncture hydrated because you will have anaphylaxis and death. And that is what was written even in Love and Bailey and all other medical and surgical books for ages. And that's what we practice for ages. We broke that because 
of some reasons. Uh, we felt that there are no definite uh, data that an aspiration of and puncture of the hydrate can cause anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis usually occurs when there is a rupture. Uh, but if you do a controlled uh, uh, puncture, there have been no, there were no reports of uh, anaphylax at that time. And that's how we started this. Now, I know the concerns were uh, that surgery was the recommended treatment and aspiration diagnostic and therapeutic was contraindicated. So in 89, at, when I joined the Sherry Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences, this was uh, uh, because of the load of cases and uh, so many people not good for surgery or not acceptable, accepting surgery, we started uh, this, uh, this technique on a presumption or on a feeling that anaphylaxis was not uh, quantitated in this uh, uh, disease. And peritoneal dissemination was a possibility. However, we knew that we need to have a long-term follow-up, which I'll show you the data. Now, how did we do this percutaneous drainage? We said the growth of the cysts is dependent upon the integrity of the germ earlier and the live protoscolosis. So if we have to make a cyst inactive, we had to make the germinal, kill the germinal layer, which I showed you on the laminated membrane, and also kill the protoscolosis. So we had to use a scolicidal agent. And not only that, we had to then, while we are doing a percutaneous drainage, we had to see that uh, the protoscolosis are uh, dead and the laminated membrane has to be completely detached. So we went on to do a technical, uh, it took us several years to really uh, master this technique. Uh, this included uh, the entry and the exclusion criteria, which I'll show you, and uh, comparative uh, studies with the uh, drug therapy and also comparative studies with surgery and long, uh, lastly, the long-term treatment. Now, this was the first problem to see how if we have a scolosis, which is on the live motile scolosis, as soon as you do a puncture, where by the side of the, uh, while we are doing, we had to say that, how can we say that this scolosis is dead? And this was done by a, a scolosis viability test. Now you can see there's a live motile uh, scolosis. If you use a, um, one of the stains, if you have a live, scolosis, it will exude away the uh, contrast and it will be colorless. While if you have a dead one, it doesn't have the power to exude the contrast and it becomes blue as it uh, uh, seen in uh, 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 slide C. And also we put these uh, fluids in the uh, intraperitoneal in the mice and over six months, we showed that if you have a live scolosis, they will grow into the peritoneal uh, hydratosis or uh, hydrated cysts. So this was the way that uh, by the bedside, we could say that we have done an effective peer technique by the scolosis viability test by dye and also by uh, the uh, mice. My studies was actually as a confirmatory proof because it would take six months for the uh, mice to grow into uh, hydratosis. Now, second issue was which scolicidal agent to use. And we took a series of scolicidal agents in different dilutions. It took us about a few years to find out. And uh, uh, finally, 20% of hypertonic saline, 95% of alcohol, 20 uh, minutes of cetramide and 20 minutes of uh, pyridine uh, iodine was effective in killing 100% of uh, scolosis. And we all over we have used hypertonic saline, although several other people have used alcohol. Cetramide and pyridine uh, iodine is very toxic and uh, can cause severe bile duct injury. So no more, they're not being used uh, in peer technique. So either we use uh, uh, hypertonic saline with 20% or some people are using in Europe alcohol. 
we did use alcohol in some patients and some of those people got intoxicated and so we left it over. So we only use hypertonic saline. Now, several years took us what is good for a peer technique and liver hydrated, good. We have done it in pancreas, spleen and kidney and bones. Our lung cannot be done. And uh, cyst size has to be more than five centimeters. If it is less than five, it's difficult to do a peer technique. Cyst appearances can be univesicular uh, or few septa. And uh, Howard, cyst uh, site is very important. Uh, it, it can be at most inaccessible sites, but superficially uh, occurring cysts and exophytic cysts cannot have appeared because there is a leakage. As soon as you puncture them, you would have a leakage. And you can do cyst in very high risk patients because, and those who have relapsed, those who have failed for drug surgery, or those patients who refuse surgery. The, the technique is under four, uh, you do a puncture, aspiration, installation, and re-aspiration. And then you wait for another 24 hours and wait for what's happened in the cyst. And I'll show you in actual images what these stages are. This is the puncture. You do a puncture of the cyst by a needle and you can see the needle. And you aspirate it quickly, which causes the separation of the laminated membrane. It's already separated. And after it, you aspirate the, nearly the whole cyst, uh, actually nearly 90%. Uh, you inject hypertonic saline in that, and you can see the hypertonic saline getting into the cyst. It causes a snowflake. And finally, you respirate and put normal saline in that, and you have the uh, laminated membrane, which is uh, free in the uh, cyst. And that is the four stages of the pair technique. And then we followed up. How do you follow up these people over the uh, days, weeks, and months? Now, this is uh, one of our patients, uh, which has a unilocal cyst. And at one month, the cyst has reduced size of a laminated membrane. And at uh, five months, nearly the cyst has disappeared. And this is uniform uh, what happens to the cyst when you do a pair technique. And this is a multivesicular cyst uh, where we do a modified uh, catheter technique. And again, you will see over a matter of six months from zero time, three months, six months, the cyst uh, would disappear. And also you can do in people. So there are multiple cysts also you can uh, treat. This patient had uh, six cysts and we did them in uh, two stings. So it's no problem that we can do uh, multiple cysts and inaccessible sites also with surgery cannot be done. The first report on this came in 91 on radiology. We had 21 cysts in 12 patients. Uh, then, uh, and uh, usually, and all of them, the cysts disappeared over a period of time. And uh, none of them had anaphylaxis. There have been no deaths. So this was the first paper we, uh, published on that in uh, 91, that uh, this is possible. The second was, should we use albendazole or not? And we did a trial, uh, put three groups, a comparative trial, and showed that if we use albendazole, the results with peer technique are better. And now uniformly, we're using albendazole uh, four hours before, four, few, 10 days before, at the time of aspiration and six weeks after, uh, in such patients. Uh, this was published in Gastroenterology in 93. And finally, we did a very important trial between the peer technique and surgery. And we took two groups and see, uh, showed that uh, peer technique is nearly as good as uh, surgery. However, it is advantageous that the hospital stay is less and the complications with peer technique are less. And finally, the last one, again, in New England Journal of Medicine, we published that long-term follow-up, and now we have up 14 years follow-up. Uh, the recurrences are only about five to 10%, and uh, most of the patients will stay uh, disease-free, and uh, there's no peritoneal dissemination, there's no systemic dissemination of disease. So based on that, we concluded that uh, uh, peer technique can be successfully done, 
and albendazole is useful and uh, it's as good as surgery with some advantages and long-term follow-up up to 14 years we're now about 250 patients nearly 250 patients and long-term up to 14 years follow-up uh, we have very very uh, excellent results so that was about the peer how we could uh, uh, change uh, the concept of management of uh, cystic hydrotosis. Now, I'll just take a few slides on alveolar hydrotosis. And uh, this disease presents fibrotic disease with necrosis, which contain this colosis. And it starts in the liver in 100%. It's not really outside those. So it's not like uh, cystic echinococcus, it can start extra. Hepatic. The disease basically starts in the liver and it invades, as you see, the bile ducts, the IVC, and the portal vein. This was one of our patients very early, which I saw in PGI Chandigarh. And you have the histology of the patient characteristically showing necrotic material, highly fibrotic, and with scolosis inside. Uh, but this liver mass involves the bile ducts, as in this patient, hepatic veins and portal veins. It also infiltrates the ceramic structures like lung, heart, diaphragm, and peritoneum. So there is a infiltration in the ceramic structures and it can uh, go to the lung and brain and bones and many other organs through metastasis. So it can also metastasize. So that is, so that is why it's important if we have an alveolar hydrated, we have to classify it on the basis of uh, primary disease from the neighbor, neighboring disease and on the uh, metastasis and stage the disease. Uh, and based on that, we can uh, see what would be the management of these patients. So you can have stage one to uh, uh, four and patients depend upon the PNM classification. But more important than PNM classification, although it's important, is to find out whether the disease is metabolically active or not, because many of these alveolar are hydrated. When they get calcified, they may become inactive. And for that, the most important way to manage is to do a PET-CT. It is the PET-CT which has become crucial in the management of alveolar hydrated, as you see in the right lower uh, uh, picture, that if you have an uh, alveolar hydrated and if the um, uh, FD, G is uh, uptake is there. So it is an active disease. And even in long term also, you can say whether the disease has become active or inactive, depending on serology, spasmic serology, as well as uh, PET scanning. In resectable disease, the best way is to do surgery and two years albendazole therapy. Now this is definitive, but if it is a not resectable disease, now data show that we should not go for surgery in such patients because the complication rates are very high. So an unresectable disease, no palliative surgery. It's the long-term albendazole therapy. I sometimes put my patients on prosecutor also and do a yearly follow-up with PET. And if the PET becomes negative and the serology, particularly with this EM2 antigen serology becomes negative, uh, two years, you can stop the treatment. Otherwise, this treatment would be needed for years and years. And some of these patients would also need albendazole uh, drug uh, level uh, to be uh, done for such patients. Vascular complications can, uh, biliary complications can be treated by endotherapy. There's some very good data from Europe that they are very, very effective in such patients. And we've also seen several patients where endotherapy is very useful along with antibiotics. Vascular complications, obviously, you may need dilatation, ballooning, and stenting. Power, several patients because of necrosis might get bacterial infection of the necrotic cavities. And there you need percutaneous drainage. And uh, it's also useful. And locally advanced disease uh, should be considered for liver transplantation. The problem with Liver transplantation is that under immunosuppression, uh, at least some of the data from Turkey have beautifully shown that the disease recurs very commonly and it metastasizes very much under immunosuppression. And that's why some of uh, these data on ex vivo liver resection and autotransplantation 
uh, is very useful. And some of the data, particularly from Chinese, have shown that they are excellent uh, results from uh, such patients. However, metabolically inactive disease, if it is on PET CT, you can do a wait and watch, yearly follow up to look for signs of activity. That much about uh, the alveolar hydrated. This is one of the patients of uh, uh, Echinococcus vogli, which I saw in uh, Riyadh on a, uh, a migrant from another country, polycystic disease. Uh, this is uh, rare in other parts of the world, mostly in South America and some of the uh, regions. And we had to do a resection of this patient uh, left uh, lobe resection, and that is the gross appearance of uh, polycystic uh, disease, uh, rarely seen in other parts of uh, the world. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this time.